Welcome to The Pestle, reviewing and breaking down movies to look for insights into the movie-making process. Hosted by drugs, there's no problem that a little coke and pop rocks can't solve. Let's dim the lights and start the show. Welcome everybody to The Pestle. Today's show is brought to you by The Winchester. Have a nice cold pint and a good time at The Winchester. Welcome everyone to The Pestle. I am Wes. And I am Todd. And this is a podcast for filmmakers, usually, and the uh, film fanatics, uh, made by filmmakers and film fanatics. Um, and today we are actually joined by an incredibly special guest from the Down Under Down Under. Um, Joe Howells is in studio, or remotely in his studio, <laughs> as can be. Uh, welcome, Joe, to the, Pos- to the Puzzle Podcast. Uh, it's so good to be here and so good to see you guys. Yeah, I'm in my own studio here. With uh, is that Baradur in the background? What's the that? That is yeah. That, so that's Baradur signed by uh, one of the sculptors, Stephen Saunders. Uh, and I'm not going to give up the movie secret for how the eye of Sauron is being lit right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to see you, my man. It is so good to see you guys' faces. It's been too long. It really has. It really has. How is uh, how is life out there? Uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, I should say Kia ora koutou, katoa, uh, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, it's so beautiful here, and it's been so fantastic. Um, being in a place that really knocked this COVID thing out of the park, I mean, yeah. it's crazy. We, I had four weeks of lockdown. Honestly, I wanted a little bit more, <laughs> uh, but they, they, it's been just kind of like, uh, other than the fact that I'm still working from home, uh, most of life kind of just returned to normal. So, uh, you know, other than the global economic impact and the fact that I really want this thing to just end so everybody can come roaring back from it, which I have a feeling we're all going to come roaring back from this. Um, it's been re- it's been really good. But I, like everybody, I'll, I've been salving myself with uh, films and art and music and the pestle and uh, reading and audiobooks and stuff. So. Uh, yeah, in, in that way, I've been kind of keeping my heart healthy. That's awesome, man. That's so cool to hear. That's pretty cool. cool. For people who don't know, Joe is a man of the world. He started in, um, Canada. He's Canadian, um, made his way down to the States. Uh, he's a multi-talented human being, uh, between acting, um, he's a engineer programmer, um, and a musician, he's a kick-ass drummer, um, and I'm sure a multitude of other things that I'm forgetting, but on top of all that, uh, he works for one of the top visual effects companies in the entire world, uh, known as Weta, and he himself is pretty talented, although I don't know if that's your focus yet, like you're a very talented animator in your own right, and you've made some animations, and uh, we'll certainly include that in the show notes if people want to check that out. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't pretend to hold myself up to the animators at Weta. It's like, oh, that, <laughs> so th- that's an animator. I'm just playing at it. <laughs> <laughs> Still, you know, that's a, it's a lot more than a lot of people can do, for sure. So, yeah, don't cut yourself short, man. 100%. Joe, you, you've done just a ton more than, you know, Todd and I, certainly on the animation side. Um, You've been in New Zealand since, I don't know, the last two years now? Um, yeah, 2018. 2018? Gosh, yeah. time is really, really flying. Um, yeah. One of the things, so when I was out there is when we recorded the uh, the first uh, film, the, the Fellowship, and by sheer luck, coincidence, this has absolutely nothing to do with anything, but that was episode number 65, um, and this is... Right episode 130 which is double uh 65 um and so <laughs> uh, right on. you won't Does be able to we have to wait until 185 to do Ugh. yeah so we're to gonna be that. close to 200 by the time we finish this thing <laughs> sounds good it's supposed to be a long trip todd don't you know anything uh, <laughs> <been> long. <laughs> we're so, starting doing two episodes a week now right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah speaking of which what are we covering today todd 
Yeah, so today uh, we are covering Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, the second of the film in the trilogy. So if you have not seen it, please go pause this episode and watch it. Uh, I believe it is streaming on HBO Max, um, so you can see all three of them there. Uh, Get some popcorn and uh, sit down. It is a long haul. It's over three hours long. Um, But yeah, there are spoilers coming on, so make sure to watch it before you listen any further. Absolutely. it's streaming on Netflix in New Zealand. Ah, Oh, or you could fly to New Zealand and watch it on Netflix. Yeah, we'll talk about a few things. Uh, We'll touch on cinematography, lighting, Middle Earth. Um, We'll look at some of the story and writing, talking about morality. And uh, there's some interesting demonstrations of possession or what I call possession in the film. Um, And of course, our special guest, Joe Howes, may have one or two things to add as he is the most insightful and knowledgeable Tolkien uh, compendium that I know. Um, and so I'm sure he will weigh in and other such stuff and things and stuff. A quick synopsis of the film. While Frodo and Sam edge closer to Mordor with the help of the shifty Gollum, the divided fellowship makes a stand against Sauron's new ally, Saruman, and his hordes of Is- of Isengard. Directed by Peter Jackson, screenplay by Fran Walsh, uh, Philippa Boyens, Stephen Sinclair, and Peter Jackson based on the novel by J.R.R. Tolkien, cinematography by Andrew Lesney, starring, whew, take a deep breath, Elijah Wood as Frodo Baggins, Sean Astin as Samwise Gamgee, Billy, Boyden, Billy Boyd as Pippin, Dominic Monaghan as Mary, Orlando Bloom as Legolas, John Rhys Davies as, Jim, as Gimli and Treebeard, which is crazy, Viggo Mortensen as Aragorn, uh, Ian McKellen as Gandalf, Christopher Lee as Saruman, Miranda Otto as Eowyn, and San- Andy Serkis as Gollum. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo. The ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing. The shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it'll shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going. Because they were holding on to something. What are we holding on to, Sam? There's some good in this world, Mr. Furl. And it's worth fighting for. Man, the look on Gollum's face in that scene just slays me. And that's Andy. And that's Andy. Andy Circuit. Yeah, that's and Andy, it's, it's it's like Gollum's like, oh, they're not talking about me. <laughs> I'm, I'm working against this. <laughs> So what a crushing blow you just dealt me. Um, and I mean me as in West, not me as in Gollum. So I'm curious, um, Todd, one, did you just watch this on its own or did you prep uh, Fellowship with it? You watched it up by itself, right? No, no, no. I, I watched the first one as well. Ooh. <laughs> and, well, there's a little... So I, I sat down and I was going to watch just... just um, Two, uh, towers. two towers and i started it and you know because it came out what two years three years after after fellowship uh they show the end one year was it one year mm-hmm. really wow that's impressive so it came out one year at whatever they show the end or like a, an important part of of the of the first one 
at the beginning of the second one. And um, uh, so I started watching it. And I was like, oh my gosh, because it starts with that with that you know shadow demon, and uh, and I immediately said, um, I need to call my son in here. And so I said, Simon, come check this out. And uh, d- d- look, nobody stabbed me. He's seven. I know. Uh, like, just hold on. Let me tell the story. So I, he comes in here and I said, check this out, man. Do you want to watch this? He's like, whoa, what is this? And I said, I said, this is Lord of the Rings. This is the second one in a trilogy. So this is a trilogy, but it's a long one. They're all three hours long, at least. He's like, wait, so this is the second one? Well, can we watch the first one? I said, okay, have a seat. And so we sat down and we watched Fellowship. Whoa. Yeah, we watched Fellowship. And there were several times where my wife came in. And she's like, why are you letting my seven-year-old watch this? Because <laughs> it's it's pretty brutal at times. It's like scary, you yeah. know? Um, there's not a lot of blood, uh, which is why I was you know, more okay with it. And he, he is completely well aware. He's, he loves movies. So he's completely well aware of nothing is real in them. Mm -hmm. So I, there were several times where I paused and I was like, are you okay? You know, is this, is this all right? Whatever. Oh, good dad. But the worst part about it was that about, um, about two hours in my daughter, who's five came and sat on my lap and she started watching and I, I spent like the next hour just like covering her face, like all the time, <laughs> just constantly covering her face, especially at the end with the of the first one. Anyway, so so we watched the first one um, two nights ago, and then last night I came in here to my room, and I I told Simon I was like, dude, I gotta go watch this movie. Um, it's the second one, but I gotta watch it. And he's like, he's he said, okay, I'll I'll be out there soon. Um, so I started it. And he came out, and I was about ten minutes in. He's like, "No, you got to start it over. You got to start it over." <laughs> so I started it over. I was fifteen minutes in, started it over, and we watched the whole thing last night. And he wow. loves it. I mean, he was talking oh, about it all nice. day today, <laughs> just asking me questions. He said, "He said, Dad, do you remember? Um, he had that vest that was as light as a feather, but as strong as dragon scales." <laughs> he like said the line right, and. And it stopped the spear. Well, but then that shadow guy was riding a dragon and someone shot him with an arrow. And how could that be? Do you remember at the end where that the, the big shadow guy is on a dragon? He's like riding a dragon and he gets shot with an arrow. The dragon does. Uh, and I was like, I don't know, man. That's a great question. You know, <laughs> like, psh, I don't know. But the point is, is that it's cool. I have inaugurated my son. That's into, amazing. Into the fold. Um uh, so I'll just say straight out, uh, you know, I, I went into this thinking, not thinking that it wouldn't hold up, but thinking like, OK, I'm going to really try to critique the the acting and the writing and, you know, even the even the CG. Right. And yes, of course, there are moments where the CG isn't perfect. But I mean, as a story it just doesn't really get any better than this. And the second one is my favorite because of Treebeard. I I could literally listen to three hours of his voice. It's the most amazing sound. I mean, as a sonic person, it is just like the crunch of his steps and and everything. So anyway, the trees getting involved, that that whole thing was so so amazing. And Simon loved it too. Um, The acting was wonderful and fantastic, but I was really just, I mean... That was probably my least favorite part of of it was the acting, but for the most part, I'm I'm just in right, and so I forgive a lot of it because I love the writing so much and I love the story, and it's I'm wanting it to take me from one scene to another, so I'm allowing, I'm wanting the next scene while I'm in the current scene. Does that make sense? I know this is important right now. I know going to 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 you know. Um, kick Saruman out of the uh, of the king is important. I get that. But I want to get to the I want to get back to to Gollum and I want to get back to to uh to Frodo and I want to get back to you know like I want to oh, there's all these places I want to go, but I have to be in that moment. And so I'm constantly in the moment knowing it's important but then excited to go to the next moment and when I get to the next moment I'm excited but then I want to go to the next moment. And so I'm not even really thinking about was that line delivered well? <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, except in like yeah. 
so for example, but I did love the acting. And so for example, um, Sean Astin is fantastic. Uh, I, I just, those lines that he has to deliver in that way are so easy to fall flat and fake. That one in particular that you played, it's that is such a hard line to deliver believably. I mean, I could sit here and practice it and and regurgitate it, right? But is that going to be believable, especially in a setting that's as fan- fantastical um, as this and almost like, I mean, the word is kind of uh, um, a little. It could be campy, right? It's just, it's just like there's dragons and there's, you know, walking trees and there's elves and, you know, all this, you know, D and D kind of thing. Um, so it's easy to kind of dismiss it as this, you know, just kind of like fanatical, like, like, you know, um, this guy who lives in his mom's basement, you know, like creating this thing, (laughs) but really it's so real. And so, and even, even my son, he like understands the meaning, the meaning about, you know, the ring being a metaphor for allowing material things and money and things that don't really matter to change you, to physically change you. Right. And that was what Gollum represented. And he, he felt sorry for Gollum. There were plenty of moments in that movie. He said, he said, he was like Frodo. He was like, I feel for him. I'm not afraid of him. He, he, he was destroyed by this thing, but he was once Smeagol. He was once, one of us and there's that's still in him and then it's so brilliant him warring with himself uh in those moments and i mean i could keep going on i want to stop because i want joe to to chime in here but i love it it's my favorite of all of the three so nice i I, yeah i just wanted to pile in on one thing so uh my uh partner had hey come into the frame for a second this is uh (laughs) I, i say partner because that's how we describe our where where has she been Hey. Oh, oh uh, they lost you. Oh, they lost us. Yeah, there you are. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So my partner and I have had acting lessons here in Wellington with uh, the woman who was the casting director for Rings and the Hobbit stuff, uh, Liz, the wonderful Liz Mullane. Wow. Uh, and, and she said, so speaking about uh, Sean delivering those lines, she said, if, if you're ever in a Peter Jackson film, you will be handed rewrites right before they call action. And, uh, you know, some directors are okay with some improvisation and walking outside the lines, and some directors are like, say the words. Don't change anything. And PJ is one of those directors, say the words. We've crafted the shit out of these words, so say them all. And there's actually, if you watch the uh, the making ofs, there's a little contest where PJ just handed, I think it was uh, uh, Billy Boyd and Don Monahan a rewrite, right before they're about to speak. And it's like, and Billy tries to get, he got one word wrong. He's like, no, wrong, wrong, wrong. And then Dom got it exactly right. It's like, ah, there, you win. Uh, But so the fact that these actors are delivering on that level and possibly being handed a lot of last minute rewrites, like on set after you've memorized everything, you guys are both actors. You know how tough that is getting a rewrite like the night before. Uh, So that, uh, that speaks really highly of the caliber of the, talent that they had on there the other thing i was going to say is that that uh, so uh the great canadian screenwriter tony bins was my first dungeon master in dungeons and dragons and he would run campaigns where he tolkienized them so he would always we'd always get in a group and he'd always split us up and he'd always focus on one group and get them to a cliffhanger and even the people who aren't playing are like holy shit what's going to happen he'd go and you guys, and he'd switch, just go, oh, man. And he, so he took that narrative element uh, that he just loved, that he just kept on giving you these cliffhangers, and then let's go back to this, just to build up that excitement, to get you excited about, oh, this next thing. Okay, well, I'm, I'm upset we're leaving this, but oh, man, I'm so, in, so into this. Um, and then the third thing I was going to uh, mention, I've completely forgot, so we'll just <laughs> uh, Well, the, one of the things you said, Todd, that I thought was really interesting was how you were – in one scene and just hoping and waiting for these other moments that you just experienced in, or you're wondering what's happening over here now. Like that to me so closely emulates the experience of reading the book itself. Like whenever you're reading Lord of the Rings, you're constantly, Oh, this 
chapter ended right when you know you were wanting to see what was going to happen next and now you're just like oh, when do we get back to that and so i think that's one of the magical things about what peter jackson did in bringing the series to life is as good as you can possibly do on adapting a novel to the screen he absolutely crushed it and watching this i kept thinking of times when i'm like i can imagine it was so tempting to cut out 30 to 40 minutes of this project and it's there you could do it and still have a lot of the meat there, but you would also be ripping out all of the soul. Um, there's just sections, right? That's, oh, here's a 10 minute kind of montage sequence uh, that's just going to go over all the things that are happening in the realm and all the stakes that are happening with the elves. And it could have been really easy and tempting to kind of cut that out and, and instead just have the elves show up out of nowhere. And now it you would be fooled. A producer would probably be fooled into thinking this is going to serve the story really well because now it really feels like they're coming out of nowhere and you can feel this bigger sigh of relief um, whenever you didn't expect it. Uh, but instead, they they kept that in there to kind of emphasize not just the fact that that's a possibility and that, that that's going to happen, but to help underscore the sacrifice that they're making, that there's a sacrifice that's being made here. And if you you know, remove some of these sequences, you're going to absolutely destroy some of the, uh, the uh, not necessarily the momentum, but the uh, the magnitude of the moment. And that's going to be served later on. So whenever you're seeing elves die, you have to understand they're dying whenever they didn't, they, it, they were so apart from this war, they were centuries and maybe longer uh, apart from their actual death. They had so much more life in them. And to me, that makes it so much more tragic than a human being dying. Um, a human that was, you know, you know, 50 and was going to live to, you know, 70. I mean, that sucks. But a human dying at 50 that was going to live to be, you know, 700. Uh, that is absolute tragedy. And so the, he, the, the work he did on this film just astounds me because no one gets to tell, you know, 10 hour films. <laughs> and he did. That are yeah. good. That, that are good and and it's it's interesting uh, so i've been reading uh uh one of christopher tolkien's last compilations called the fall of gondolin uh, gondolin uh and so this th this is several drafts of a story that actually happens way back in the first age and in this book there's a letter uh, that he publishes uh that tolkien wrote to sir stanley unwin of unwin publishing that after he finished lord of the rings uh Lord of the Rings, he felt so much like he had failed. He was absolutely certain that Lord of the Rings was not going to do anything. And it's heartbreaking in this letter. He talks to Sir Stanley about, uh, I'm looking forward to a retirement of poverty. And I'm just going to be reviewing manuscripts until I slide into my grave. Uh, and he was, he was so depressed. And that's because he wasn't a storyteller. And that doesn't mean that he wasn't capable of telling a great story. It means that it took him 12 years and he didn't have a word processor, so he mm -hmm. would write the story and get 900 pages in and go, go, this is off the rails, set it aside, start over. And that's why it took him 12 years. So it's really easy for us looking back at his process and go, man, he was so meticulous, every detail. To him at the end of the process, he's like, it's taken me 12 goddamn years of my life. And I don't think this has any hope of commercial success. They can't even print books this big. Like That's why they had to split it into three. And uh, uh, so the way that he told the story was so unconventional and it was so hard on him not being a storyteller. A storyteller would have set things up so much more easily so that there was a, a better way to find a through line. He had to search through the weeds for it because his approach is, I'm a linguist. Here's a beautiful word. Now I'm going to make a story around this word. And that's just such an inefficient way to, to craft a story. Uh, so the way that his, his, his approach worked, uh, he ended up telling a great story, but was only after so much effort. And I, I, I kind of love the, th there's no proof of this, but I like to think that, uh, you know, there's, there's an interpretation of Lord of the Rings where Shelob and Gollum are the unwitting heroes of Lord of the Rings because uh, Frodo fails. Frodo does all this stuff and ultimately fails. And I won't talk too much about it because that's for episode 185 uh <laughs> but does that erase his the fact that he's a hero he actually turns into a villain at the last minute but is he still a hero and i think 
I think the, I, I mean, my answer is yes. And I like to think that that's a little bit of Tolkien forgiving himself, that I went through all this stuff and ultimately I haven't done what, I, I haven't tied this story into this great universe that I've built that later Christopher uh, published in the Silmarillion. I just like to see that moment as Tolkien going, I, I still went through all of this and that time that I spent was valid uh, and I forgive myself. So That's so good. Like, so let me just run through a few few notes because there's so many things. And at the end of this, Joe, um, I forgot to tease this at, at, at the beginning, but I have a quiz for you to test your Lord of the Rings oh, Tolkien yeah. knowledge. Oh, yeah. There was a quiz at Weta and I failed so miserably. <laughs> Mine will be so much harder. I'm going to have you counting the grains of sand in scene five. So <laughs> you're going to know it's super easy. So cinematography wise, uh, not a light in this film. Uh, there's not a lot of mixed lighting. Like a lot of the light is kind of single source lighting. And so, which makes sense. I mean, we're in like Middle Earth, which is representative of mid, mid, medieval times, Middle Ages. Um, and so usually, you know, you're, you're dealing with one uniform color from one light source, like the sunlight or the moonlight, um, or fire that kind of use, they, they use fire usually kind of as the most often way to mix in light colors. Um, because that's kind of the only color temperature that's going to differ from, you know, a moonlight, um, especially or dusk. Um, and so just kind of the, that's, that's always a challenge, I think, is trying to make it visually interesting in a, in a time period whenever you don't have access uh, to all these lighting color palettes, um, so to speak. It's not like they can throw in a neon sign, you know, over Mordor and say, hey, you know, get, get it here. You know, so it's uh, always a challenge. Um, one of the other challenges with this film is creating separation. And so if creating separation when you're supposed to blend into the background is really tricky, right? Because normally in a, in a film or a scene a video, you want to create contrast between the actor and the background. And you're often, you know, trying to contrast the wardrobe against the backdrop. But for characters who are hiding, <laughs> right? Contrast creates danger. So if you have these hobbits who are trying to slink through the countryside unnoticed by anyone, especially, you know, the bad guys, um, well, then they should blend into the environment for their own safety. If you, if you don't do that, uh, if they're suddenly wearing, you know, neon green, uh, whenever they're supposed to be, you know, in brown, then that's just going to be a, a bit of a sight for anyone who's looking for them. You know, the Nazgul are suddenly flying overhead, like, and you're sending up, you know, flares. Um, and so that does create a, a problem though, because even though we don't want them within the story to draw attention to themselves, uh, we, the audience, need to need to help identify them within the frame. And so drawing attention to them within the frame is a, kind of a cinematography trick of, well, what do we do? Um, and in their case, I think, you know, they're, uh, they seem to do a lot of three-point lighting setups, which is, you know, kind of a main light and then a fill light and then maybe a backlight uh, to help pop them out of the, the background. And that backlighting, uh, also, you know, what I call a, a rim light, um, that does a lot. That's that kind of uh, very light colored lighting that's going to uh, kind of outline the, the hair usually or the, the shoulder. Um, and that in itself creates c contrast uh, between them and the background. And, th and then on top of that, it felt like they often tried to position the actor against a more shadowy background. So even though they couldn't necessarily create contrast with just pure color blocking, they could try to create situations where they would be standing in front of shadows with a strong backlight. And I thought that maybe the easiest way for them to do that was seemed to often be, well, let's shoot a little bit more towards the sun or maybe side lighting from the sun so that all you need, need to really do is kind of bring in some balance. And in their case, I'm sure they had like some uh, some one Ks that were out there, you know, they were blasting into their actors' faces. Um, but if not, you know, just some nice hard bounce uh, to to fill in their face. Now we have some nice bright light so that we can see their eyes and see their face. Uh, but if the the sun is in the background, then what that also means is that if there's a tree or a bush in the back, 
those those items are going to be backlit and it's going to create shadows on their front and that's going to allow you to have some contrast against the uh, the rim light that you're creating uh, that could also be the sun but i don't think they necessarily relied on the sun for a lot of the rim light it seemed like they were just off camera blasting some some pretty hard i don't know joker bugs or something like that um in order to because if you're battling sunlight, you have to come with a, a much stronger light. And I don't know if you all realize this, the, str the sun is a very powerful light. <laughs> there's there's a lot of energy there. I know. I know. Just, you're kidding. We drop all the knowledge here on the pestle. Um, oh, my gosh. And then the other... Uh, I, I was just going to pop in here really quickly. So I, I watched the 4K remaster of the theatrical, <clears throat> uh, which is also HDR, which means high <laughs> dynamic range. Uh, I wanted to capture some stills for this podcast, but HDMI's HDCP wouldn't let me capture stills. But I was going to say, speaking about, there's a shot when they're running across Rohan, the three of them, where they're walking, they're running into a sunset, and it's actually the sun. And uh, Heather and I did some comparisons. So on the 2K, without the HDR... They're just silhouettes, but with the HDR print, you actually see the rhythm of the fabric uh, in the silhouette. So you can see like Gimli's cloak moving around as he runs and stuff. Uh, and yeah, with those 4K, I remember what I was gonna say before, Todd. The, uh, the remasters look great, but I find that if I just don't think about it for 15 seconds, I'm in the story and it's invisible. And it's just every once in a while, there's a beauty shot, and I'm like, oh, 4K, uh, HDR, wow. <laughs> and then I'm just back in the story. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would I would add two comments to that. For one, uh, just to get on my my film horse, like that's the beauty of film. Like there's so much detail in the film. Whenever you go back, you know, whatever ten years later, rescan it. Like there's so much more detail there. You know, that you can pull back out for something mm -hmm. like an HDR pass. Uh, so great call. Um, and, and oh, the other comment I was gonna make is. I think because I watched this on HBO Max because I only own the, the extended editions and we wanted to cover the theatric versions. Um, I think watching this on DVD is a better experience for me. Uh, the, the lower quality kind of helps hide some of the, the blemishes that you know pop up here and there with some of the compositing or um, maybe even Gollum himself at times. Uh, and so I kind of like watching the DVD version as as a method of like losing myself and forgiving some of the blemishes. But I mean, I completely agree with, you know, what you were saying, Todd, like I go with it anyway, because I'm so sucked into the story. Um, yeah. And then two, I I wonder and this. This is going slightly askew. This is something I was saving, but we're, we're on it now. Um, yeah. One of the things that. I would be okay with that is probably blasphemy to any rings enthusiast is I would be okay if five years from now <laughs> Joe. Joe's face just mean mugged me. No, uh, I would be okay with like five years from now. Um, if Peter Jackson, mm -hmm. PJ mm -hmm. wanted to come back through and do a cleanup, like do it the, the right way, as opposed to a certain uh, industrial light and magic uh, alter um, who, went and re-polished uh, the original uh, trilogy of trilogies. And so I would be okay if he came back through and said, okay, we're going to uh, come and, you know, maybe polish up some of the composites or maybe uh, relay some of the, uh, the yes. texturizing of Gollum. Um, because as good as he is, the performance is all completely there. And I have to believe that with the way technology's advanced in the last 20 years, you have to think... This was done 20 mm -hmm. years ago, um, and it's still beating the pants off, you know, so many mainstream films. Uh, yeah. The technology that, you know, Weta has now, y'all y'all are doing some incredible things. Uh, if, you know, just go look at the dragons on Game of Thrones. Like, it's absolutely astronomically wowing stuff. Uh, I would be okay with that as a purist. I'm not maybe the purest of purists, but I love rings. What do you, what do you, what say you, <laughs> Joe? <laughs> well, what it's, say it's, you? How? <laughs> like, uh, P, so PJ did, I don't know if you've seen, he did a little uh, YouTube video about the 4K remaster. And he talks about how he, like, he kept it in blemishes and all. So there are a lot of composites in there that you're just like, oh, it takes you out. Uh, so what's, what's improved in the remaster? So there's one shot that really struck me where uh, uh, Aragorn and Arwen are talking, and they're in that kind of blue blue light, and it's like moonlight. And when, you, when I'm watching like a Netflix stream or a DVD, you can see the color compression, so the luminance is even, but you see little bands of color on Aragorn's forehead. And when I watched the remaster, it pulled me out because I'm like, his forehead is completely... 
It's like 444 color. And I apologize, anybody who isn't in film, you don't know what that means. And it's way too boring for us to talk about. But (laughs) there's no, the the color and the luminance are completely even across his head. And so that's where I was like, okay, that was money well spent, man. (laughs) I was was really glad to see that sort of stuff. But it's it's interesting that he was really careful that we didn't, they they did online some effect shots from my understanding, uh, just to re-render them at a higher resolution, Mm. but they didn't change anything. It was just a remaster and just uh, recolor. So, but if they did, if he did do that, Wes, in five years, it's not like, like if you do that, you got to do the whole thing. Like you can't just do like a scene here or scene there. Yeah. Because then that just makes people mad without making a huge difference. Right. Yeah. I think there's money in it though. Like I think if he went and did that, oh, totally. you could re-release in the theater and you would absolutely crush whatever, you know, money you spent in doing it. Um, I think that's that's really heavy. And I also want to make one one comment. Joe, did you did you say Arwen? Are we doing the books? Or are we doing the movie, Joe? <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, Ar- Aragorn and is talking to Arwen. Is yeah. Arwen in the movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ar- Arwen is. It, yeah, they have the the flashbacks. Uh, at, so after the war battle, and he falls off and into the river, uh-huh. uh, and and break. He's kind of dozing off and Brago comes to wake him up uh they do a flashback to him in Rivendell uh and I think I think that's kind of the only uh appearance of of Arwen in Two Towers Uh, I got you got you and there there was talk about Arwen fighting at Helm's Deep well Uh, Philip Aboyan said that was a choice but there was a lot of fan backlash when that kind of got out and they said you know what Arwen's hero moment in this film is is choosing mortality because elves are actually immortal they don't actually have a lifespan uh, if especially if they live in Valinor at this point, they are immortal. So she is really sacrificing a lot uh, to to be with Aragorn. And they were married for a further 122 years. And she died of a broken heart a year after Aragorn died. And imagine being an immortal being and you don't die of, you know, being attacked or something that she died because she missed him so much after that 122 years. Uh, so I really like that they decided to honor that heritage of Arwen rather than kind of a, putting a sword in her hand and forcing her into a masculine role. It's like, let's let's leave her in her feminine strength here, that her strength was, uh, you know, I'm, I want to be with you. Let's be together forever. She also, yeah, she's also in the scene where, the, where all the elves leave Rivendell. Yeah. Yep. In in this one, so she's in she's in it twice. I guess. I think. Yeah. No, you're two. absolutely. You know what I was I was confusing. Um, Aowen because they combined Aowen, they collapsed two characters for yeah. Aowen, didn't they? Um, yes. Yeah. Aowen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, oh, good call, man. I can't remember the other character's name. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So yeah, that's yeah. where I was getting tangled. Yeah, I, I was uh, confusing Arwen with uh with the other collapsed character, and I was I thought you were going like. 30 layers deep on us. Um, and I was like, Whoa, <laughs> crap. Um, but the other kind of going, rewinding a little bit and like creating separation. They all, they obviously also use like depth of field, just creating a little shallow, uh, and all those things combined kind of help separate the characters when it would have been very tempting to, to, I don't know, figure out another way to make them pop out in the, of the background. Um, cinematography wise, another thing I like that, that they did that I don't see a lot of generally speaking, um, is they use slow mo, uh, slow motion as a transition element. There's that scene when mm-hmm. Aragorn returns um, from having almost died, right, and he kind of dramatically bursts through the doors uh, to talk to King Theoden, um, and that's all in slow motion. Um, but we never finished that actual scene. That's just a cut to a strategy session. Now they're discussing what's happening in the realm and the best way to approach it. Um, and I love that. And then I was, it was very simple, but it was just a great way to kind of end this scene in a lot of, uh, with, with momentum and with grandiosity, because the other way to do that is, uh, kind of play it at a normal speed and he enters and we have a dramatic hold with him on a pose kind of staring down and then we cut to the strategy session. And so this is just a much more elegant, beautiful way to do it instead of this kind of soap opera-esque style. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There's a time and a place for those things. Um, but, you know, probably not in an epic <laughs> where, where possible. Um, yeah, I was curious what you would think, Wes, about, because the, you know, there's certain ways to film uh, uh, 
movies where like you might you might try to make the camera uh, the camera work a little consistent so it's almost the point of view of you're another character in the frame uh, or, or not in the frame you're another character out of frame kind of observing it uh, but they leaned way into this camera is going friggin everywhere we're going to be looking up at Treebeard and then we're doing overs and then we're cutting to a wide to remind you hey, here's the scale and stuff and it all works just just beautifully but i i kind of love that they just leaned into it this camera can go anywhere it can be anywhere yeah they're pretty uninhibited with it i mean some of the the things that i found just really crazy was the the sheer volume of locations that they have you know is just mind-boggling because yeah we've visited a lot of rings locations here uh, the there, that we have a book of all the rings locations, and it has three hundred some odd locations, and we visited like four of them. So we got a lot oh of work. Oh my to gosh, <laughs> that's so insane! Because you might just need, you know, a little two-page sequence, um, and some of them uh -huh. even less than that. Uh, but in order to get that, to get that scene, to get that two minutes of footage, it might mean traversing, you know, to this other side. Because you have to understand that each of these characters, especially in this film, not as much in the first film. In this film, everyone's gone haywire, right? We have, what, three, four different uh, storylines uh, diverging into different locations, which also mean different features, depending on the route that they're taking over the land. So, you know, Frodo and, and uh, Samwise need to be in this rocky, you know, kind of place, and now they need to be in the marsh. And, and so in order to do that, not just the the crazy amount of, you know, location scouting, but also whenever you're talking about the, the variety of shooting styles, like they're also having to haul out cranes and dollies, um, you know, he helicopter shots. Uh, and if you do a helicopter shot, of course, that means you need to stage the scene without actually creating a visual footprint that destroys the scene. Um, and so there's just so many things that you have to keep your eye on so much coordinating, um, in, in order to get all this done. And then the sheer manpower, I assume in some of these shots, um, is just absolutely astronomical. And this, I, I feel like this would be one of the eighth wonders of the world in, in my, my esteem. <laughs> like it's, it's... Yeah. And, and it's funny, I've had a couple of just personal film projects that I do here and I don't know about the rest of New Zealand, but but Wellington is like, oh, you need wind? I'm calm today. Oh, you need <laughs> oh, you need sun, clouds. You need clouds, sun. It's just uh, and so like watching the making ofs. I'm man, I would have washed out out of annoyance at the weather so much of this because you'll have a whole crew. It's like, well, we're shooting a sunny scene today, but here's a snowflake, so we're doing. No. <laughs> so yeah, props to them, man, because man, they went to every location here and just muscled through it. It's just incredible. It really is. It really is incredible. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm split. Like, I'll say real quick that I'm excited and terrified about Dune just from the standpoint that HBO Max today announced that they're going to release it yes. uh, over HBO, HBO at roughly at the same time that they're releasing it in theaters. Um, and that scares theater, me yeah. for the future of uh, theatrical releases just because I think they're, they're so scared about the state of the the world today and how the theater is going to fit into it because of the pandemic that they're not really thinking clearly because that also means there's a absolute bent up hunger for for theater and live shows and those things aren't going to go away they're going to explode if they just hold on just long enough um yeah from, i'm hoping that gets retracted yeah really same. that's what i'm hoping <laughs> yeah because i would be uh it's criminal to release that movie in that way. No, 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 no. Um, but as far as the technology, I'm a little torn just from the standpoint of I'm excited about what they're able to do because uh, that plays very much to what I've always wanted to do with projection uh, projector uh, kind of style of filmmaking where you're capturing in camera some of the effects that you want to do stuff that we've seen Christopher Nolan do with like uh, interstellar or that we've seen um, capturing I've... final pixels we call it you're capturing final pixels yeah nice thank you capturing final pixels so same thing with oblivion uh, that was the first film I remember seeing that actually decided to do that and it was uh, wildly beautiful just because you're you're able to use the light from the scene instead of 
the green screen is providing the light to you. You have to light as if there's a sun out there. You're having to light as if there's a sunset back there. And it's just not the same. You're never going to, you know, get that exactly right. Whereas if you just have that projecting, you can use that light for your scene. Um, and that changes everything. But the, there, there's so much incredible stuff that's going to come out of that. The thing that doesn't excite me about it is that feels a million miles away from me. Like I'm never going to have access to that. Uh, the <clears throat> amount of budget that I would have uh, to have to have creators, you know, styling those sets for me, uh, it's completely impractical. Like I, from a low budget, like, oh, if one of my first, you know, three films gets a $1.5 million budget, that would be like, raining mana like uh, that's the elves stepping in at helm's deep at the last minute like that's just life-saving stuff that's so good to hear from from someone who's in it with like the people who make the greatest things you know yeah so i to, to answer you my my thoughts on that is that there is no way that theaters are going away like wes said or like like live venues are going away. That shit is gonna be there and it's gonna explode when we when we can go out again and feel safe. The problem is is that um, nobody really knows if they're allowed, if they can feel safe or not. Yeah. You know, you have some people who are terrified, um, and then you have some people who think that it's completely ridiculous to be scared at all. Um, reality is usually somewhere in the middle, um, and and. You know, it's it's up to you to decide your own level of 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 risk and comfort. But when people don't have that risk, don't feel that risk anymore. Um, which I don't know if you know. Who knows? It could be six months. It could be a month. It could be a year. <clears throat> but those things are never going away. They will be there. And maybe the place that you loved won't be there. Maybe Alamo won't be there, even. But someplace, if Alamo is not there, I'm just saying, if Alamo's not there, some other place will be there. Yeah. Um, and it's going to fill that void, right? Uh, you just and... made Heather cry. By... <laughs> <laughs> Heather, don't worry, Heather. Heather don't don't right worry. Now. They're still there. They're still there. <laughs> Doing okay. Um, but what I was going to say about about what you were what you're saying about these these um, the way like they you know they filmed uh, uh, Mandalorian stuff is like I love that shit. Yes, I'm not going to have access to that. Wes, you're not going to have access to that, but it doesn't even matter. Like yeah. what what like good things are coming out of this terrible time. And the good things are these massive advancements and creativity in order to still create. Right? We can't go to places and film. So we tell actors and and crew to to lock up for 10 days and then come work and stay in this place for a month, right? That's what we got to do. But we're all in one place and we're all together and we've quarantined and everybody is safe. They fa they find a way and we invent technology in order to continue making something um, instead of, instead of, okay, maybe a film would feel more organic if you go to a place and you film. And I think that everyone, it's like, it's like record, it's like recording audio on tape. I, I don't care who you are. If you record on tape, it's better. It just is better. And pe a lot of musicians will tell you otherwise. They don't know, you know, no way, but it is better. And you can't even put your finger on why, right? You go, you go and you film on location. There's something organic about that that's never going to go away, no matter how good CG gets. But, but there can always be advancements. Yeah. And Wes, like you said, this movie is, is, is this trilogy is one of the great trilogies of all time to me and i think to everybody on this podcast right <laughs> and it was done 20 years ago we're sitting here saying like imagine if they made that exactly the same way but with the technology of today well the technology of today i would argue this year has exploded in so many different ways and it's not just with the actual physical technology but the ideas of of technology that will be created in the next coming years because of of creatives having to think on their feet to continue creating right so in a way i think yes i love that um do i think it's going to be a replacement absolutely not but it is something it is something else yeah that that you know the 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 studios have 
in their back pocket to make something awesome that we'll love and and review on this podcast you know no that's so true i mean you look at what they're doing on mandalorian and you just extrapolate like oh yeah what if you know the what if marvel had been using that the whole time like some of the the marvel films would have been mad you know massively improved by using that tech um oh, yeah. instead of green screen i mean i'm just thinking of like uh infinity war or uh guardians 2 like there's certain sequences that i'm like oh, the lighting in this i can feel them trying to match all this green screen business and all i really want to be is pulled into this world um and so yeah i mean it's super exciting and if there's anyone that should have it in their hands it's you know and you and i in the indie world wes you and i have painted a lot of fake zombie <laughs> eyeballs and had to match uh, motion and and all kinds of stuff uh it's great to free artists from that kind of concern because it's very mathematical. It's not very yeah. creative work. Yeah. So when you can just do that and you put something in a, in a, in a layout and now the light and the lens distortion matches and everything matches. Now you can tell the story yeah. and free the artist from, from worrying about the technological aspect of it. And to do that properly, you need unbelievably smart people like our York Bungert or Nick Booth or Matt Mueller. Those guys are unbelievable. I think wow. about them every night whenever I'm falling asleep. <laughs> yeah, I bet you. I bet you. I bet you're thinking about them right now. <laughs> it's all I think about. <laughs> and so, yeah. I mean, but you're absolutely right. Supporting the story is the number one goal. No matter what, uh, if if a film gets too caught up in the technique or the the effect, uh, you usually have to worry and have some concern if if it's going to be a good story. Um, and because that's ultimately what we're all showing up for or normally. Um, and, in, and in this case, like the story and the writing was, I mean, obviously you have Tolkien who laid the groundwork. Uh, the, the reading rings isn't like super satisfying for me, but watching it and experiencing the story absolutely is. And Peter Jackson just did time and time again, like an incredible job. One of the things I love about this movie um, is how it begins and you know todd you pointed that out like uh starting with gandalf falling and going through this battle with the balrog is absolutely amazing uh for one just on a practical level like a fast exciting start to the film and that's really important especially in this film because this is a really long film and so you want to make sure you grab the audience's attention right out of the gate so that you can remind them that yeah this is an exciting story uh but you know forgive us we're gonna walk you through the middle of nowhere uh with two tiny people <laughs> like uh, so just just hang on <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah we'll get to it um and so seeing him battle the balrog you know helps also sell his reappearance later in the film it's a great way to hide a rehash of the last film um because that's always a problem with sequels or continued stories, even in books, is how do you remind people what happened before? Who are these people? Um, how do you do it in a way that also helps bring along anyone who missed the previous installment without losing the rest of the audience? Um, because otherwise you might get pulled into like boredom or tedium as you do like this five minute last time on Lord of the Rings, you know, this, these are the kind of things that we forgive in TV shows where they do a recap of the, the last whatever. Um, but whenever you're doing it in a novel or in a movie, much more delicate, uh, novels, I've read so many, you know, book series where they spend roughly half the book reminding you of what happened in prior books. And they do it in this very sneaky way. Uh, well, they try to do it in the sneakiest way possible by just hiding it within the story itself, whether it's two characters talking to each other or just doing it piecemeal as it's relevant. Like, um, you know, whatever. Uh, Aragorn not yet recovered from the fight against the, the zombie horde or whatever it is. Like, they try to just insert it. And so in this film, he did very little. Like, he kind of relies on you in this... Uh, not just having seen the film, but just kind of going with it. Um, because on the one hand, if you just watched The Two Towers and you'd never seen The Fellowship, you would understand everything that's happening. Um, all the story elements are right there for you to kind of follow along, but you would be so much more enriched having seen The Fellowship 
because there's moments that you understand between like Gimli and uh, Legolas where you don't understand what it means for Legolas to step in and threaten someone else who's threatening Gimli. Like if you just see that and you're like, yeah, of course, why wouldn't two buddies stick up for each other? Whereas if you watch the first film, you have some inkling of understanding that there is bad blood between elves and dwarves. And so the fact that there's a friendship is already kind of meaningful. The fact that one is willing to die for the other is like, uh, not heartbreaking, but the opposite of what heartbreaking, heartwarming, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like that's, that's really, you know, important storytelling elements. Um, and so it's, it's, he did just this very slate of hand masterful way of making sure you understood these characters. But to be fair, Tolkien did a lot of the groundwork by making these all very distinct characters in and of themselves. Um, and he allowed for those, uh, those characters to kind of shine through and conflict with one another where important. Um, and I think PJ just did a really great job of letting those moments come to light and, and uh, breathe. Um, and before I go further, Joe, did you want to add anything into how you think he adapted just that element of where, because, okay, I'm going to cut you off before I give you a chance to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, tell well, me what the, uh... One of the nice things about trilogies, the middle film should have everything going for it. Because for one, you we don't know have the characters, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you already know the characters. You don't have the trouble of a slow start and trying to introduce everybody to the world. You don't have to do any of that world building and getting the story going that you have in the, the first film. Uh, the problem with the last film is you don't, now you have the problem of resolving everything and tying it all up. And the middle film, you get a fast start and uh, you end it wherever you want at the peak. You don't have to have a 15 minute resolution after the climax. Like you can, here's a climax and credits. Like <laughs> you just go straight out. Um, and so it's all fun and very little like labor. <laughs> like you just get to have all the best parts that you want and tell the most compelling story. And so this is a lot of people's favorite of the, of, of this series. And I think that's probably got a lot to do with wise because uh, you don't have any of the concerns of a first or final film. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, as a d adaptations go, I mean, they, they really paid so much as much homage as possible to the books while at playing to the strength of film, because there are just decisions that Tolkien writes in the books that work so well in the book. Like having the eye of Sauron not be a corporeal thing, that it's just a feeling that something is, it's not a feeling that something is watching you, it's something is watching me, and it's so creepy in the theater of your mind. And that cannot work in the medium of film. It, that would be the dumbest choice. Imagine seeing the top of Barador and there's just nothing there, just the two points. Uh, and, and I think even book purists are like, yeah, that eye was a really good choice. Uh, like yeah. literal, literalizing the eye. And they do that over and over again. Like there was no space in the film for the conversation between Gandalf and, uh, and um, uh, who's Carl Ur Urban's character? Amer. 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 So Gandalf and Amer in the book have this conversation where he says, you know, you have to forgive Theoden and Eowyn because they were falling under the thrall of Wormtongue and Saruman. We, we, we enter the Golden Hall in the middle of Rohan being taken over and just kind of find out, oh, we just interrupted something that was kind of halfway done. They had taken over the king and they were working on, on Eowyn. And in the book, Amer's a little upset with that. And so Gandalf has the line, imagine what she went through uh, you know, a hutch to trammel some hidden hidden thing. And he's telling Eowyn, forgive, uh, he's telling Amor, for, forgive her, because mm -hmm. she was going through something it, it wasn't under her, her control. Uh, Rohan was being uh, taken over from the inside. And there's no room for that conversation. And it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been really good. But giving that exact same dialogue to Wormtongue, to say to her, it changes it a little bit and changes the context, but it honors that beautiful prose. Like that prose is so, just so gorgeous. And coming out of Worm's tongue mouth, it, uh, Worm Tongue's mouth, it takes on such a such a creepiness, and it, it it helps to elevate his motivation in the film, which is I love Eowyn and I'm going to do everything that I can to kind of be near her. 
it, it kind of supports and elevates that motivation of his. Uh, and it, there's just countless examples of that through the film. And also uh, uh, crew members doing that. I don't know if we're, we're kind of done with the cinematography thing, but I wanted to talk about, I'm going to have an Andrew Lesney treat in every single one of these things. Because <laughs> uh, Andrew Lesney, bless his heart, rest in peace, w was, was a huge Tolkien fan. And in Fellowship, you'll remember... They had Workshop make this giant ring so that they could get a deep focus mm -hmm. shot without having to use a diopter. Um, and in on this the film, shot in the, on, in, on the mountain with the, the snow, yeah. right? Yeah, with the ring in the snow. They said, well, yes. we, we need something huge so I, I don't have to uh, you know, punch in. I want the depth of field to be all the way out there and I don't want to use a diopter. Three second uh, shot. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's yeah. it. Three seconds and, that, and make a giant ring. Yeah, that ring exists somewhere here in New Zealand, and I'm on a quest for that ring. I want yeah, to find it. Yeah. Uh oh, a quest. Um, but so for this one, uh, can we can we try? I, I just wanted to share an image. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to try a, a quick screen share here. You'll see in that ring. So you know we're 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 used to seeing highlights in an actor's eye, where it's like a couple of boxes or a, or just a circle or something. And there mm. you've got like twenty little little circles in her eyes so uh in the legendarium uh galadriel is six thousand years old at this point and she was born back in valinor and at that time the entire the entirety of existence was lit by two trees named laurelin and telperion and uh, galadriel is old enough to have seen those trees uh now the you've heard of the silmarillion mm. this book the silmarillion so feanor got the idea to create the Silmarils from the color of Galadriel's hair. He noted that Galadriel's hair had the two colors, the silver and the gold of uh, Telperion and Laurelin. And these, uh, I won't go into the story of those jewels, but those jewels become extremely important through, through the rest of the legendarium. Andrew Lesney, in that shot, so this is, a, this is a conversation, a telepathic conversation between Elrond and Galadriel about where we are and where we're going. And he wanted to reflect that heritage in her eyes. So that's like the light of Telparian, Telparian and Laurelin in Galadriel's eyes. Her 6,000 year old memory of the two trees of Valinor and recognizing the fact that we are, if we stay in Middle Earth, we will fade to nothing. Uh, so it's, it's most of our fate to go back to Valinor if we want to continue to exist. Um, and so that kind of depth of, not only nerdness about the legendary, <laughs> That's uh, the right word. but it, yeah, it was, it, I mean, that level of care and love for what Tolkien created is present at all levels in the writing, uh, it, it, you know, in the, in, in the set dressing, like you'll find every single aspect of the production, people just head over heels in love with it. And I think that, plants kind of, that's kind of the fertile ground in which if you just now just make a film you can't help but honor that heritage and make it the best adaptation in this medium possible yeah that's, that's kind it. of the goal right whenever you're going to make something like this you want to you want to wizard of oz it you want to make sure no one's ever going to try to remake this one <laughs> yeah because <laughs> it's funny at the time i was watching these films like this is ushering in a whole new era of filmmaking is going to change everything and f for me not a lot has been able to reach that pinnacle and it turns <laughs> out 20 years later it's like no this was like a, a insane high watermark in fantasy filmmaking that i i mean i you know I, I love me some marvel films and i love me some fantasy films and i love me some game of thrones but man i i don't think this high watermark has been matched since <laughs> definitely not i mean let's it starts first with it starts first with the detail of a book, right? So if we're talking about ad adaptation for a second, um, there is no, I mean, like what other book is going to, what other book with so much detail has, I mean, is going to be adapted? Like really like, okay. So you, what you just said, you and probably a hundred other people on the planet know about that, right? <laughs> serious. I'm serious. Like whoever did that knew nobody's going to know this. Like a few, a handful of people 
throughout history probably are going to know this, but it's not whether or not people know it, it's whether or not they feel it. And when you have, like, you don't need to tell everybody, this is why I did this. You just need to do it and do it a bunch of little times throughout the movie, um, uh, throughout the adaptation, I should say, to create something that as a whole feels like it pays homage to the greatness of the story, right? That was written of the book, of the book itself. And, so, and, and I think you guys, especially you as a, as a director, Wes, you can imagine a conversation on set where Kate Blanchett is looking at that rig and going, wow, I've never seen it. That's, that's kind of pretty. What, what is that? And Lesney going, oh, this is the, the twin trees and stuff. And there's no way that Kate Blanchett didn't say, wow, yeah. the stakes are, uh, I, I can play, yeah. I can play against this. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I think once we get the next, the next Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, then someone can put that much detail in it. But even, even just like a very basic story, you know, a very basic book being adapted to a film, I think whoever makes it, I mean, you just, you got to love it, right? Because everybody always says all the time, yeah, the movie was good, but it's not, the book is better. Everybody always says the book is better. But they don't say, like, I don't hear people saying, oh, no, Lord of the Rings book is better. I, re I mean, I really don't. I mean, yes, I I, he I do hear, like, obviously, like, you know, super nerds. And I use nerd in, in a very loving way. Um, I really do. <laughs> but but we'll say we'll always say the book is better because they're just ad adherent to... to uh, Tolkien himself as a as a as a writer as a creator but but like you know we're filmmakers right so we can look at this from both both angles storytellers and filmmakers right and so so I, I mean really you know if I have the book or I have the movie here I'm like the movie is uh, whether or not you like the book better it doesn't even matter the movie holds up 100 percent it's because of those little details man yeah. I mean not just because of them, but I would say that the difference between like this adaptation and and most others, even really, really good ones, are those little details there you probably know a hundred more that that we don't know. You know, yeah, I'm shattering my gory details. Yeah, yeah. That 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 all add up. These little things that all add up into something that's great. Yeah. As opposed to something that's good. Did you? I don't know if you guys. Saw, so there's a uh, an author named John Ackoff who tweeted, "In the history of literature and cinema, is there a movie that was ever better than the book?" I'm having a hard time thinking of one. Can you? And there's a screenwriter named Josh Olson, who just said, "Stop with this snobbery," and he listed like 30 movies that are better than the book. And he's like, <laughs> uh, "What was it? Uh, the Godfather, Mary Poppins, Wizard of Oz, High Fidelity, Jurassic Park, The Graduate, No Country for Old Men, The Ice Storm, Misery." Uh, and he just went on yeah. and on and on, and it was so great. And and to um, to Akoff's, uh credit, he was like, "You know what? You're absolutely right." Like he admitted, <laughs> that, yeah, I just got owned. But I've, uh, that kind of plays into what I was talking about—the deification by book snobs of authors that authors mm -hmm. can do no wrong. Uh, the deification of authors and the vilification of filmmakers all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I like both books and movies, but books are written by people with faults and they're imperfect. And Tolkien considered himself a failure when he finished these books. Uh, so uh, I, I love the idea of other artists being able to come in and provide their view of the reality and not treating, uh, not treating Tolkien canon as the Bible. I, I don't want anybody to go in and change Tolkien's canon. I don't want another book written called Lord of the Rings where somebody changes a bunch of stuff, but adapting it to other medium, let's let let let's bring other diverse viewpoints into it. Absolutely. I mean, one of the great things about this story, and I one of the reasons I think it's so universal, is it's a movie about good and evil and how we see each other. Like the morality of this movie kind of stands out without ever feeling like you have to ascribe to any particular belief by making it fantasy. You got to explore some of these concepts without actually trying to enforce or uh, be dogmatic about any particular worldview. He got to create an entirely nice. new world and say, here's right and wrong. Um, and now you don't have to feel either part of the right or part of the wrong. You can insert yourself wherever you see fit. And I think most human beings are going to side not with Sauron, but with the ring uh, bearer and, you know, the, the fellowship. 
And this movie is great because it doesn't just, you know, say, yeah, it's about good and evil. They go through great pains to test the characters with moral choices. Like, and this film is filled with this, um, with all kinds of choices, some more direct than others and not more obvious. Um, but like, should the ends go to war? There's this moral choice um, that they're wrestling with of, uh, should we go and, you know, the the morality of, you know, Mary and Pip are, like, of course, you're a part of this world. You should absolutely go. One of the things that's kind of an unasked question in that little dynamic is, was it right to ask them to go to war uh, that they didn't see as theirs? Um, but I think it kind of resolves itself very nicely by showing them that they were involved all along. They just hadn't yet realized it. Seen it yet. Yeah. And so that revelation, yeah. you know, just pays big dividends. Um, but there's all kinds of other moral choices, you know, is it okay to lie to Schmeagol in order to save him? Um, of course that creates a complication in Schmeagol that, you know, hurts, hurts the whole cause in some ways, you know, in this film or in future, in the future, uh, the next film. Um, but should Faramir let them go or give them over to his father? Like that's a moral choice that he has to make in the moment. He has the power and in this movie, we see time and again that uh, the desire for power or more power is a very corrupting element. Um, but Faramir has that choice to make. He also has to decide if he's going to take the ring for himself. He's he he's in that that authority, that power, and he has that moral choice to make. Um, you also see Gollum is an incredibly interesting character because it would be easy to write him off uh, from a writing perspective as just a, a foil and someone that is just there to kind of play a part. And instead they give him a very rich storyline where he fights his alter ego in the hopes of restoring his humanity. Like that's such a, a, a incredibly interesting storyline um, where it's only really made possible because of the way Frodo treats him. And yeah. of course, you know, and what's really I think powerful about that whole trio is Sam's judgment also made it unsustainable. Like it didn't matter how hard uh, Gollum or Schmeagol was trying to do the right thing. Sam was never going to accept him. And so whether or not I think Frodo ended up uh, betraying him as it's viewed by Gollum, even though what he was doing was saving him, that that nuance and complexity is completely lost on Gollum but that nuance is there in the film for the viewer. And yeah. the fact that we have to wrestle with all these things within us and fight for Gollum and hope for Gollum that he will understand uh, is all the moral elements that's being asked of you to understand and explore within yourself um, that you know is right there. It's in the text, and it's incredibly well uh, transposed by Peter Jackson. Um, because otherwise it just becomes very kind of name ha hammer on the nail, just constantly beating you over the head with this, that, this, that, and the other, instead of saying, okay, is it right to do this thing is, you know, do you think this character understands what's happening? Even though it's never expressly said to the audience what's happening. Uh, they never really, you know, hammer that home. They just expect you to understand and follow along the, the moral dilemma that, that, uh, Frodo is going through. Um, and then, you know, you also have the, the evil characters, um, so to speak, that are going through their own, you know, issue. I don't want to call them issues, but their own uh, struggles for power because that desire for power is very corrupting. I mean, Saruman abandoned all his ways in search for more power. Um, and that's a very sad story, especially whenever you see, you know, what Gandalf was expecting of him, what he was wanting from Saruman. Um, and to see what he's come to not, and you also see that reflected through Treebeard, right? Treebeard was like, no, Saruman's one of our friends. I used to walk and talk with him as, as a young sapling or what have you. Um, there's this, yeah. this, this depth that's built through these characters that some, even though we never got to see Saruman as a good guy, we get to feel what he was like as a good guy through the other characters and their expectations yeah. of him. Um, and that's, just all richly layered and beautiful storytelling about the, the power um, of the ring and the power of power itself, the desire for power. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, to some degree, material possessions, um, as Todd was saying earlier, um, and just the expansion of your own estate 
and I feel like Joe is wanting to chime in right now. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so I, I think one of the central th themes in Tolkien spoken to us now from the trenches of World War One, is not only seeking power is dangerous, but wielding it once you mm. have it, even in small mm. ways, you are going to hurt people that you have no contact with. Uh, you know, and we, we've seen that in our politics, even, even politicians we might agree with. Wielding power, just wielding the power that they have and kind of going, oh, well, those people did that, but it didn't happen. Uh, that stuff happens outside the edges. And as someone who was sitting there being shelled at the Somme in Verdun, uh, he has an un on the ground understanding of even wielding this power is massively irresponsible. And that's why you see things like, you know, later Gandalf's a little more powerful as Gandalf the White, but he's very sparing hmm. in, in wielding it. And that's because his, uh, his Maiar form, he didn't want to go to Middle Earth because he was worried about wielding too much power. So Wow. Uh, like I said in our previous podcast, his power is inspiring others and just using the power where it's just, oh, we need a little bit of, a little bit of juice here. Uh, so I, 100%, man, w uh, watching the bad people just, oh, I have power and now I'm going to use it. It destroys them as well. That's so good. So good. One of the, the tricky things that this film does really, really well that most films fail miserably at is what I'm going to call demonstrating possession. Like if you ever see a, a film where someone is fighting this internal battle with a, a demon inhabiting their body, right? A, a ghost possessing them or something. Um, it's always, you know, it usually comes down to faith uh, and just believe it away, you know, just believe in the light or whatever. Um, and this film does an absolutely incredible job because Frodo is kind of pseudo possessed, right? By the ring. He struggles with its call and demonstrating that and selling it to the audience as a real viable pain as something that could really take him over is something that takes a lot of delicate storytelling. Um, and it's absolutely incredible. Usually it's embarrassing on film, but they execute it by not just relying on Elijah Wood's performance, but also by strong editing and music choices. So inserting like mental images of the Nazgul reaching form, right? Those white corporeal forms uh, just kind of pulling, pushing out for him. Um, and then you have, of course, you have close-ups on Frodo's reaction, um, the audio choices like dulling the world down um, and adding tension with music or the drama. And of course, by finishing it off with the nearby danger of the Nazgul themselves, like the ring wraiths are right there. So if he gives in, there's an immediate consequence. And they do so many great things by showing everyone fleeing. Like you see uh, Samwise and Gollum running away and you see Frodo trying and failing. And you know what he should be doing that he's not. This is so well contrasted to help demonstrate his struggle. Whereas most films, you kind of just plop someone down in the chair or on a bed and you just stare at them as they fight, you know, wrestle around with themselves in bed. It's completely unconvincing. Um, and, and here they just found all the right ways to tell you he's having an emotional internal struggle um, that they're just visually demonstrating and using every ounce of uh, film technique to, to help sell for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and one of the reasons why I think it, it, it's timeless, and they're, like rewatching these films, I'm like, um, so, so kind of touching on personal correctness, uh, on uh, political correctness. So uh, Amazon today just uh, released the headshots of 20 new actors in their new Lord of the Rings, and there's so much color in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's been debate among the purists, uh, should there be, you know, African-American should, should there be black and Asian uh, uh, elves? You know, they're described as fair and blonde haired. And I'm like, man, if Tolkien lived now, absolutely there would be. Let's. I want to see some color in the elves, man. I want to see. I want to see color all over this new series. But the way the characters comport them uh, uh, themselves back in 2020, like, or back in 2000, uh, I, I love one of the things about Aragorn's leadership is that he doesn't have any of this masculinity where it's like when someone expresses to Aragorn, dude, I'm scared. It's not like, well, just fight on and we <laughs> shall triumph. He never does that. He listens like Eowyn. I fear a cage. 
and that eventually I will just accept the bars that I'm behind. And he doesn't dismiss that. He takes it in and he listens to it. You're a shield maiden of Rohan. I don't think that'll be your fate. So he's giving his tacit, yeah, I know your uncle isn't into it, but if I see you on the battlefield, holy, I'm going to fight next to you. You know, you go for it. And then later on, he, he lifts up the blanket on her horse and sees the sword. And she's like, don't look at that. And he's like, I know what you're doing. And he supports it. And also, Haleth, son of Hamelmine at Helm's Deep. This is the kid who has a sword. And yes. this is when they're drafting, they're drafting children because <sighs> you're all we have. You're all we have. And you're watching all these children and their mothers going, I'm about to die. And when Haleth says, the men says that we shall not live out the night, Aragorn doesn't doesn't do that kind of toxic positivity thing where it's like just fight on and believe in the fuck. He the way Vigo plays it is so gorgeous because he has this look on his face like this kid is probably gonna die. So what can I do to make him accept the fear? Because the best chance of this kid surviving this battle is if he has enough fear. And then my job is to build the bravery behind it. This is a good sword. And then, you know, shows it to him and and kind of becomes the bravery that I want you to inhabit. Come with me here. And then puts his hands on his shoulder and says the opposite of what Aemir says earlier in the film. Abandon hope for, or, uh, you know, do not trust the hope because it's abandoned these lands. He says to uh, Haleth, there is always, always hope. hope. And he looks him in the eye and then just walks off. And I, I, I kind of wish there was a button on the end of Helm's Deep where we see Halleth with everybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that was kind of a mistake not to have a button on that little moment because it's yeah. such a strong moment. And it really shows you, wow, Aragorn just like at Helm's Deep, Aragorn became the king of Gondor, not mm -hmm. only with Halleth, but with his moment yeah. with with Theoden. Where he says, let's ride out and meet them if that those moments are like, holy shit, this is the guy who can be king. Yeah. And that was before the elves got there, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. I remember when, when the elves marched in, I looked at my son and he was like, I have a video. I have a video on my phone. I took, I'm, I'm like, of, of the, in here, of us watching it, and I go like this, and he's sitting right back there. And I, and I go, and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> wide-eyed. I go like oh, this, and, and he's like, wow like oh my gosh like he could feel it he even felt it he's seven and he felt the weight of that it was it was just a beautiful moment and there's right. an amazing adaptive choice because in the books the elves leave men to their own fate there mm. and in a way having the elves there kind of robs men of a little bit of their heroism but i i don't think so because if, if you, when you when you read the books it's not like the elves aren't fighting in middle earth on their way to the gray havens they're protecting the north they're protecting Rivendell. Rivendell's under attack while all this is going, and we don't see it. The Shire is under attack, and we don't see it. And the elves are fighting everywhere. So really, it's not that egregious to just say, well, why wouldn't the elves come and, and help men at, at Helm's Deep? And maybe it doesn't work in the books, but in the film, oh, I'm 100% there. It would have been a mistake not to have elves elves. Mm -hmm join them and then Haldir having that moment of seeing yes. he's dying and he's seeing the elves die and uh one, one thing that some people might not know is the dead marshes that Frodo and Sam and Gollum are walking across those are the battlefields from the prologue of Fellowship of the Ring uh where uh Thranduil from the Hobbit gained his bitterness because he saw all the elvish forces die he saw his father Orifer die he saw Gil-galad the greatest uh, 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 battle leader of the elves die there and that's why he retreated to Mirkwood and said I don't care about any other race but us we're, we're here for us uh, and there's that moment that when I saw it in the theater of Haldir looking at that and it's like oh my god that he must be thinking this is what Thranduil thought did I make a mistake coming here was it worth all this elvish blood to come and help these men at Helm's Deep and it's such, a, it's such a nice little color. It's such a nice little nuance yeah. to those moments because eventually they are victorious. Yeah. Uh, but I, I just love colors like that. Yeah. And, like, I, and how badass is Legolas? Can we just say? <laughs> badass. Just, He's just as badass as when I, when I saw it in the theater in 2001. I, I looked at Simon. I was like, 
Dude, how cool is this? When he gets on the horse, what was that that moment where the horse is running past him and he just grabs the horse and it flings him up over and he gets lands on the back of it? I looked at Simon and I was like, what? <laughs> this, guy, this guy is awesome. <laughs> and, and there are times where I'm, I'm looking at him like going down the stairs on a shield and I'm like, oh, come on. Okay, that's really that's cool. pretty badass oh my gosh he's an elf he can just do it it's fine and i love what you said earlier about you know just the the new amazon casting having just so much more color in it um, because that is one of the the failings of a lot of fantasy worlds is uh it's very vanilla anyway i wanted to move on to the final segment uh which is where we put joe through the paces uh there are six questions the the last one is actually like a two-parter it's really five questions that's kind of six wait i'm totally not bringing up tolkien gateway on my <laughs> <laughs> and so these are incredibly hard no i'm kidding these are very very easy i probably don't know almost any of these i think i know two of these um offhand but the others i really didn't wouldn't have known including this wait hold on one second one second are you drinking out of a fucking chalice <laughs> Yes, yep, you are. Of, the hell so you are. Our friend, uh, our friends, uh, uh, Alex and River in Austin, gave us these dragon glass oh. goblets. That, here's here's Heather's one. Too. God yeah. damn, that's awesome. <laughs> God, everything about you is just cool. Okay, keep going. You, you have the floor now, Wes. All right. So, question one, Joe, what is the sigil of Rohan? Uh, it's uh, uh, the it's horse like kind of rearing up on its okay. yeah, it's a horsey on its hind legs. <laughs> it's <laughs> <a horsey. laughs> that is the proper way. <laughs> okay. Something interesting about about the Maris. So Shadowfax is one of the Maris. They can understand the speech of men, but they can't speak it, which is an interesting choice for a linguist to put into a book, because horses don't have the physiological ability to speak English. Uh, but Shadowfax can understand commands. He just can't speak them back. Question two. Who's older? <laughs> yeah, we're just... <laughs> I don't know what to say to that, Todd. What do you say to that? <laughs> you say question two. <laughs> <laughs> Who's older, Pippin or Mary? Oh, no. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. I have no idea. Who is older? Well, you got a 50-50 shot here. <laughs> yeah. I'll, uh, Pippin. Come on, man. Pippin. Mary is older. Oh, oh you failed. According oh, to the text, Pippin was the youngest of the four hobbits who set out from the Shire and the only one who had not yet come of age. Interesting. Oh, Joe. no way. <laughs> <laughs> Question number three. What does Saruman's name mean in Quenya? I'm not sure if I'm even pronouncing the name of that Elvish language properly, but Quenya. Oh, my I have no idea. Ooh. I didn't even know it was a Quenyan name, to be honest. Nice. <laughs> Saruman means man of skill. Really? Okay. <laughs> this is completely useless Ooh. info, but I'm having fun. I'm just <laughs> trying to test how far your, your, your knowledge goes. Okay. Um, maybe an easier one, maybe not. Question number four. Where was Tolkien born? Uh, he was born in South Africa, right? Uh, Correct. Yeah. What was the name of the town? Bloemfontein. Holy crap. Yeah, I wasn't expecting you to get that part, but it was <laughs> Bloemfontein, uh, South Africa. Jeez. Um, <laughs> speaking of Tolkien, who were the Inklings? Question number five. Uh, the, so the Inklings were a, a group of writers that included C.S. Lewis. Yep. Um, yeah, that's as far as you don't have to, of, like... Yeah. Quote their, yeah. <laughs> their, like, like, their creed. The about them is they lamented not having the books that they wanted to read, so they were like, "We got to read them." That's awesome. So they, so they wanted to. Read them. And I and I think that's a good filmmaking creed too. Is like make the film that you want that doesn't exist. Um, yeah. And so, question five B or number six, depending okay. on how you want to count this, is where did the Inklings meet? Oh, there, there's a pub in Oxford. I can't remember the name. Darren Ormandy would be able to tell you which pub that is. I'm sure he's been at that pub. Oh, uh, I've been yeah. to that pub. Have you? Ooh, Ooh, yes. Do you know the name oh, of it? What? No, I don't. That would be really but cool. But I've been there. I had a pint there. No I, way. I, I, there's no way I'm going to remember. But Todd, yes. that's literally the only place in England that I want to go. <laughs> to Oxford? <laughs> to the Eagle and Child, which the is Eagle the name and of the Child. pub. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> You've been to the Eagle and Child? I have. I have. No way. Yes, man. I, I they 
I saw a uh, symphony and a choir like right down. The, there's like a round kind of amphitheater thing right down across the street from it, basically. But one of the, my wife was there at the time. But uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Tom York lives there. No way. Yeah, they're they're from there. They're from Oxford. Oxford. So wow. I was like walking around the streets looking for Tom York. I, I got drunk. Not know in you had a drink there. <laughs> That's ah, nice. uh, I've, yeah. I've wanted to go there for like the last I don't know twenty years. Like that's they have really they cool. have a chalkboard outside and they have token quotes that they write on the chalkboard like every day. <laughs> like awesome. a different like a different quote all the time. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Eagle and Child, also known as the Burden Baby or just the Bird. <laughs> the Burden Baby. That is so <laughs> cool. Oh my god. Cool. Nice. Yeah. So I think that's pretty much all we got. Um, I, this is easily a film that is three hours that we could spend six hours talking about. Um, yeah. And so with that said, I want to ask, what are you, Joe, going to recommend uh, this week? OK, so uh, I am actually going to recommend. Where is it? Sorry, I'm just uh, there it is. So this is my newest YouTube subscription. Uh, it's called Cinema Therapy. Have you seen those guys? I have not. So no. it's a guy who's a licensed uh, therapist, and he's a, I think he's got a degree in psychology, and then a filmmaker friend of his, and they watch films and kind of have an analysis, because as a fan of The Pestle, I'm a fan of film analysis uh, podcasts. Uh, so I'll, And I'll give you the link that you can put in the description. There's a really interesting analysis of Aragorn, as the exemplification of non-toxic masculinity. And I, I shamelessly ripped off some of, uh, you know, me talking about him taking in what Halleth and what Eowyn said from the, these two guys. I can't remember their names, but there's brilliant observations. And so far, 100% of the cinema therapies I've watched have been really fascinating. And it's funny, they always talk about, you finally made me cry, but they seem to cry in every episode. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. So, yeah, cinema therapy. I'm really enjoying that. Wow, that's awesome. Nice. What do you got, Todd? Uh, I'm not going to recommend a movie. I'm just going to recommend a, a musician that I've been really into, and it's it's a... Billy Boyd? You've... It's what? <laughs> <laughs> Billy Boyd? You've been... <laughs> No, I mean, she's she's like huge and everybody's heard of her and it's old news or whatever. But I don't think that anybody's ever like actually sat down and listened to a full album of hers. And I would recommend this to both of you guys, you know, specifically because you love music. Uh, it's Billie Eilish. Ooh. Um, you've heard you've heard a song. You've heard two songs. You've probably heard four or five different songs of her record. But sit down and listen to her album. She just dropped a new single and it's fucking incredible. Um, but everything her and her brother Phineas do turns to gold and there's a reason for it. And it's not just because it's good. It's because there are the, the same details that are put into a movie like this of love of what you're creating. They do that. And they'll, they'll spend a week on a snare sound. They'll spend a month on her vocals. Like it is painstakingly detailed and it's beautiful and it's simplistic and you listen to it and you would never know there's 120 tracks on a song because you can only really hear four you can hear you can hear like a kick drum and a snare and a hi-hat and then maybe a bass and her voice and that's it but there's really 50 things going on and it's just un unbelievable the clarity and the beauty, the beauty of the words and the way she sings, and it's just un, unreal. Billy Eilish, wow, melt you will melt you. Yeah, nicely done. Um, I'm gonna recommend the Hobbit, the Rankin Bass original cartoon. It's like one yes. of my favorite things oh ever. Oh my god, I remember that. Oh, I grew up on that. I love that movie so much. And you will be able to find uh trailers for all those things. I don't know that there's necessarily a trailer for either one of yours things. We'll link to it. We will find the clip of Aragorn. We'll embed that in the show notes and we'll definitely link up some Billie Eilish. You know, it's funny. I don't think I've listened to a full album. I've listened to a lot of cuts, uh, but I've never sat and Very listened Very few people listen to through. albums. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I yeah. spend so much time listening to podcasts and digesting information. I 
anytime I find myself listening to an album, I'm like, God, why don't I do this more often? Because yeah, it just changes my life, my day, to be completely frank. Um, yeah. We have a short spotlight this week. There's a, a short film you'll find embedded in the show notes. It's called Eker, Eker Who Lives Under Our Bed. It's by a filmmaker <laughs> named Joe Howells. Um, and you will find that in what? the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a great it's a just a little story about a a little spaceship spaceship. (laughs) i'm going there immediately (laughs) it's so dumb (laughs) it's great it's him you can see his and this is him just passively playing around with animation and uh visual effects and i remember fantastic yeah 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 no for something that he just kind of threw together joe whatever bro that's like really really strong solid jobs yeah he's he's absolutely incredible um so stay tuned for next week i think we're doing burning that'll be with special yeah. guest dave um that's he has no last name he's kind of like Cher. special guest dave <laughs> <laughs> just dave, <laughs> dave. Um, i think that's what we're doing if not it'll be amadeus we're we're scheduling all kinds of crazy stuff right now um but, oh, I'm looking oh. forward to that. Yeah. Cool. And so subscribe, review on iTunes, Spotify. I don't remember if we're on Stitcher or not. Uh, whatever. Wherever you're listening to us, go ahead and rate and review us. Um, and leave us a note. If you want us to talk about a thing, we'll talk about that thing. Probably. Um, or if there's a thing you don't want us to talk about, eh, that's fine. Um, <laughs> you can Whatever you want to say, you can do that at thepestlepodcast.com. And on this episode slash the two towers and our quote of the day is from alexander the great whatever possession we gain by our sword can cannot be sure or lasting but the love gained by kindness and moderation is certain and durable really by that guy he said that that's crazy right and what i love about it in the context of this film other than obviously one man who was trying to like rule the entire world um, is that perspective. And if you just think of what if Sauron had succeeded and I love this perspective because it kind of says, even if he had won this battle, he would not have stayed forever. At Mm. some point he would have fell just because you cannot command love. You cannot command obedience indefinitely at some point. point. You're going to have your comeuppance. Um, there, there is no sustainability with that worldview. Um, Man, I don't know what to say to that. I can't believe that's a. I can't believe that's a quote know, from right? Alexander yeah, the Great. Great, you wouldn't expect that from. <laughs> to be honest, a conqueror. I'm a, a murderer, murdering world conqueror. Yeah, uh, but really, I mean, you know, Tolkien. That that really reflects Tolkien's worldview about conflict and power. That's. Yeah. Incredible, man. Good choice. Thanks, man. Yeah. Wow. I mean, even my seven, I'll say it again, even my seven-year-old son knows what Lord of the Rings is really about. It's very obvious. Um, And he gets it. And he's a a giving little boy. And that's so cool that he, you know, has this, you know, this epic story um, that he's like super into to help model. after him like that's I'm, I'm just so excited that he's into it that it exists you know so thank you peter jackson for do it for directing it in the in the brilliant way that you did i mean it's just it's unbelievable but anyway joe thank you so much thank man. you brother i you know really i wanted to make you know we wanted to make this as long as an episode as possible because i just want to see your face more 100%. and Heather's face more. I'm unfortunately I would have rather seen Heather more than you. <laughs> uh, she's prettier, but but I'm so I'm so happy that you guys could join and 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 thank you so much for your brilliant insight and <laughs> there she is there she is. <laughs> I love it. Uh, anything you want to add before we go, man? Uh. Uh, just everybody be well let's all have a great Christmas it's been a hard year for everybody I don't think there's a single one of us who's going into this Christmas not having lost something Uh, so let's enjoy ourselves there's a vaccine coming and I think I think we're going to come roaring back and I think cinema is going to come roaring back Uh, and and I'm, I'm really feeling good about 2021 
I love your undying optimism. That's fantastic. And it's infectious. And we're going to end it with that. Thank you so much for joining us, Joe and Heather. Really appreciate it. Uh, Again, like Wes said, please like, subscribe, share with everybody. Um, It all helps. It really does. Uh, And tell us what you want us to review. We will review it. I guarantee it. Um, Until next week, I'm Todd. I'm Wes. And I'm Joe. Go watch the movies. We love you guys.